This is Freddie Gillespie, the chair of the Open Space Preservation Commission. And having a quorum, we're starting the meeting at 1.06 p.m. February 23rd. We have a pretty busy agenda, so I'm going to um, jump right in. I am going to do one thing. As we said, we may take topics out of order. And this is the first topic out of order. It is the DCR public access review. I believe there's a meeting tonight or tomorrow night. Anyhow, um, I wanted us to have a comment for there and I wanted to um, bring in, and I don't know if anyone can bring up a link to the Mass Audubon's important bird area. Sure, I'd be happy to share that, Freddie. I have it here. Okay, so the first thing is, it's about public access and it might be for the whole Sudbury Reservoir area, but you know, a lot of the land they're talking about is in Southboro. You know, there might be some other areas that they're talking about beyond Southboro. So our comments are specific to Southboro. And I just wanted to raise some issues. Like we are very supportive in the past of having trail access and more trails because of certainly during COVID we saw a massive increase in trail use and the need for it became really evident. And we, as a commission, supported the expansion of the trail. Um, and I forget the exact name, it was the CPA article. Do you guys remember that last year? Mm -hmm. it, goes, it goes from Fayville and around the dam and it connects to the Bay Circuit Trail and other trails, right? It's part of the Burroughs Loop or the Aqueduct Trail. So, that's all great, but a couple of things, um, this important bird area and another issue that we work on, which is habitat. And we know that whenever you put a trail in, there's huge consequences to the habitat. A trail mm -hmm. will impact, I believe nesting birds, 150 feet on each side of the trail. So you're, you know, you're actually wiping out bird nesting habitat for a very large swath around any of the trails. Other wildlife is also negatively impacted. Um, so as much as we want to support trails where appropriate, I would want to suggest or see if there's a, your feelings on making a recommendation that they keep much of the land not accessible because it's the only place that the animals have to go. You know, where there's no people barging around. And, you know, the other day, Wherever people go, there's rules that what you can and can't do, but it doesn't mean people always follow them. Um, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, there was somebody flying a drone at Breakneck Hill. And the north, I mean, there was all these birds chattering and flying around. And as soon as it started to fly, they all were quiet and disappeared. It's not even breeding season quite yet. That's just one impact that people bring as well as no dogs allowed on DCR land. So that's not an issue as much, but um, I don't know. So you have Freddie, a thought about that? Yeah, so, so I'm torn quite honestly, because I definitely don't want the habitat to be destroyed, but I also am really, really supportive of trail systems within Southboro. Would it be possible for us to put some restrictions so that there can be trails, but people can't leave the trails, that, that type of thing? So. I'm not saying no trails. I'm mm -hmm. saying we're going to ask that they consider leaving most of the undeveloped land as undeveloped. And mm -hmm. if you see this, so this is just one incident of, one example, not incident, of habitat. This reservoir was declared an important bird area in the state of Massachusetts. And it was one of the first IBAs. And that is based on breeding habitat and which birds are migrating through. And if we um, increase trails, you know, you're reducing that and you mm -hmm. might be actually wiping out the ability of a species to nest there. So this is one document. Um, I think one of the statements in it is, where am I going? Um, Human disturbance is growing as the area becomes better known to hikers, joggers, and fishermen. That's a conservation concern. And this was written 
I, I don't even know, but 10, 20 years ago, I mean, I found out that it was an important bird area when I was newly on the commission. So I don't know how long ago. And just think of how many more trails we've put in there. And this is coming from someone who, when we get conservation land, the first thing I thought about was like, yeah, where can we put the trails? And it wasn't until we were putting trails in it at um, Beals Preserve, one of the trustees, and I was designing the trail system there, one of the trustees asked me, Freddie, what about, when are you gonna think about trail pollution? And it hadn't ever occurred to me before that. So the point is, if you need a trail to get from here to there, okay, but what you don't need trails everywhere. Yeah, we you need, definitely don't need trails everywhere. I mean, within that, if you look at the land around the reservoir, one of the other problems we have, and you know, people like to fish, but wherever there's, you can tell where the hot spot fisherman access is because it's where there's the highest pollution with the wires and the cups. And I mean, you can't blame all fishermen, but there is certainly a high percentage of um, that fishing line does horrible things. I mean, I have it all around my house at the end of Deerfoot along the and, river. And the birds and the turtles and sap. I mean, everyone gets, I mean, it's not a great thing. So at what point does that become a negative for the value of the habitat? So I guess the question is, how do we create balance, you know, around wh which parts do we think would be okay to have a trail and which parts do we want to be completely um, undeveloped with no trails? Well, I think right now we have, you have the Bay Circuit Trail running the whole western side of the reservoir from, uh, I'm sorry, the eastern side, all the way from uh, Marlboro down to the dam. And then there's a trail that cuts across and then goes around the dam. And now there's a planned connection that um, the trails committee, who's doing a great job, completely supportive of their current plans. I'm talking about, and I don't have a large plan of the property, but if you can think of all the little areas. Like, why do people have to walk there? The, the point of a trail is to go from here to there, right? In my opinion, right? To, to, if we have a massive trail system already planned, why do we need more trails at the expense of habitat? If you look in Southboro, where's there any habitat? Where? Wildlife is not impacted by dogs and people. And I think our sort of open the trails committee would support the fact that trails need to be limited to preserve habitat. What, I guess what, I'm just wondering, like, what is our what is our point of view or statement that we absolutely should have no trails on that land, or that we could have a limited amount of trails? Uh, you know, sort of what I think we all agree with your point of view, but what what then are we saying is the outcome of that? I think. Um, I would hadn't thought that far as a definite, but to consider leaving mm -hmm. the existing undeveloped land of the reservoir undeveloped. We do not need trails throughout the whole perimeter. We, you know, let the trails committee and support of the trails committee connecting, you know, we have a Burroughs Loop Trail regional. It connects to the Bay Circuit Trail you know, huge regional trail. And they're also connecting to a trail system that is part of our Burroughs Loop Trail is a planned trail system from Wachusett Reservoir in Clinton all the way to Cleveland Circle. Mm -hmm. So I just don't see the need to increase, um, increase people going into the already undeveloped areas. Sarah, can you speak a little bit to your neighborhood? You have a lot of, like people who live a, a next to it, maybe, you know, they have little trails going in for the, but it's, how would you feel about a massive trail going behind your homes? And I, I wouldn't, I know like that's a little it. nimby, but sorry. I, I wouldn't like it. And I was thinking about that as you were talking. The only time I ever see people back there would is, November and December in hunting season, I'll see a random 
hunter walk through. Um, which is another thing because my backyard and my kids are playing and there's, you know, hunters back there. But other than that, I really wouldn't want people back there mostly because it's so undisturbed. Not necessarily that, I mean, I wouldn't love people walking near my backyard, um, but it is one of the only undisturbed areas that there really isn't any human traffic. Um, I think there are some small trails, um, old ones, but nobody's really allowed back there. So my, like my neighbors, we don't go back there. We leave it. And I've explored back there once in the four years I've been here and it's beautiful, but it's, there's, you know, I, it's untouched and it would, mm -hmm. I know there would be, I know there would be trash and I know there would be destruction of plants and right. habitats because you, you can see evidence of things living back there when you go back. So I can't really see the map. So I don't know. It's so small. I can't tell. Oh, what I, well, I can't but, um, there, let's see. The, I just don't think there, I think there are enough trails that we don't need. And, and again, I'm not saying don't finish developing the trail system of um, where they already are, where they, or where they are planning connections. I will say that because, and this isn't great, but what? yeah, I see. Can you go on? Can you, can somebody go online and um, just do a, uh, do you know how to get on the GIS? I don't. Okay, so this is getting a little bit down into the weeds. This is a but preliminary I think we're the same thing. Is that we support the trails that are already in existence and the connection of those trails, but we're not looking for new trails. We don't need trails on every single piece of land right. that right. could have a trail on it. Like so that's so that's a specific point of view. That's what I was kind of looking for. Is like, what are we saying? We're not saying no trails ever anywhere. No, nope. but we're not and, saying do whatever you want. <laughs> and if there if there is a desire to put a new trail in, mm -hmm. we're just adding a one point three mile trail. I think that's what it is, right? It makes sense. It connects. Mm -hmm. If there's a purpose, but to just have trails with you know people randomly so they can walk in. One other thing I am well aware of besides the breeding bird issue is that where people walk predators follow so all of a sudden you will get raccoons and skunks going in where people mm -hmm. travel that then start to are their predators to other critters right so they it creates more negative impact from other wildlife even mm -hmm. which is kind of um, an, another situation so I want to say that I would also I would like to argue for not argue but um, advocate better word that wherever they're putting in new trails if dcr is allowing new trails they need to allow parking that's my perspective living on the south side of town where all of the trails on the north side of town you can't access if you can't drive there because have you tried walking have you tried walking from uh across route nine or the causeways you know, people, I, people with children riding bikes, it's just not safe. You know, we don't have sidewalks. So and I honestly haven't used many of them because of that. Yeah. And granted, I don't know where to start. I saw, yeah, I saw a little, she might have been seven year old girl driving up the causeway on 85 towards, towards <sighs> the, uh, yeah. And you know how they wiggle their, 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 um, their handlebars, I was ready to call the police. Like, what was she doing there? She was so alone. And then I got, I was on the causeway. And then when I got almost to Route 9, I saw her father with another little child. Mm -hmm. And all I can think of, this was a big mistake. And, you know, he'll never do it again, I would hope. But it just pointed out to me the visual of that child with the, the, the handlebar. You know, she was barely great at bicycling on that road. And that, um, you know, we're not going to tell little kids and families to go bike over to the trail system. Mm. So Sarah, you don't walk it because of that reason? Yeah, I don't. 
I can't walk anywhere from where I am. And I don't know where to park because there's no parking. Yeah. So I just think it's not if DCR is willing to allow more trails anywhere, they bear the responsibility of allowing parking on their land. And I, you know, I know that um, for this newest trail that the trails committee who have done an amazing job and a lot of work um, and totally I'm supportive and we were in the past for their grant, I mean, not grant their funding with CPA money. Um, and they're in a grant application now um, with the state that should be done. And they're, you know, putting in some parking or trying to put some parking in for handicapped access maybe, but like everyone needs to be able to park somewhere if they're going to have these trails. Shouldn't it only be a lot, it shouldn't, these shouldn't be trails just for the abutters or people who can walk close by. So if that's all right for me to say those two points, Mm -hmm. that our recommendation is for I agree with those. Mm -hmm. and I think yeah. the meetings tonight so I'm just going to go that we're supportive of the trails committee's current plans for connections to the existing trail but not for trails just for the point of having trails into the um, undeveloped areas we prefer that to be left for the wildlife mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if they are putting in new trails at DCR um, we recommend they consider the creation and building of um, parking areas for those trails. So one of my, um, before we move on to the states, one of my uh, concerns about the current push to do, have more dense housing in town and you know more development from the state and um, other agencies that want us uh, around the T station particularly. And my question is, where is the state pushing to create more recreational opportunities for people that don't impact habitat, but, you know, um, parks and things like that, because, you know, on a hot day, where are people, you know, so that's a whole nother issue, but it's like, if you want to increase people, you have to be aware of the, the density of um, population, where are people going to recreate? And that conversation has not happened that I'm aware of. So, and traffic, but all right. Next agenda item is back on schedule, not schedule, but back on the, um, back on the um, first item that I moved. It's update on the winter sow. So we had a huge success in our efforts with over 1500 seed packets put out there. Um, and we still have seeds left. And I was wondering if we wanted to think about how to um, utilize those. So there's a couple of things going on. Uh, we have, the reason we do the winter sow is because these native seeds, many of them need a period of freezing and thawing. They co-evolved, co the plants co-evolved with our, our weather. So, we want them to, you know, get the full benefit of the winter that they, they need to germinate. But some of the seeds don't need that. And there's a potential if the library or um, some other group wanted those seeds, we could put up a program for that. They have something coming up, um, I think at the end of March, if we have any seeds left that fit that planting time we could put together a project for that. So I'm just throwing that out there. Um, we have a potential to be working with the Rotary Club as one of our partners, but um, with St. Mark's students, I haven't heard back from there. And also a project maybe with Algonquin, one of our key volunteers um, is actually putting in some plants at the high school maybe. For, with a class, an urban gardening class. And um, we're gonna follow up with the teacher to see what opportunity there is there, okay? Do you have any other ideas or? Oh, and any of the bulk leftover seeds will go to Breakneck Hill um, once they came and where they should go, but um, for the meadow. Yeah, I also make an announcement on the, um, the sort of uh, native plants, pollinators, website that there's leftover seeds that could still be. Um, well, 
Because I got to be honest, you know, I, I kind of felt like I missed the window because I was so busy at that Would time. Would you like some seeds? Yeah, I'd like some seeds, but I thought okay. oh, I probably missed it. You know? No, here's, the, here's the, the only problem with what you're suggesting is to put out another round. Mm. The energy that goes into packaging up orders and getting orders and then people don't show up to pick up their orders. So we still are. I'm still reaching out to people. Numerous emails, phone calls, texts. Yeah, no, I wouldn't say that kind of thing. But but I'm just wondering if you have seeds that are already packaged and, you know, those are seeds that can still be planted, a subset of them, that maybe you just leave them in a central location and say anybody who wants can come and pick up seeds. But don't. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking of that. Um, We prefer... The reason we prefer to make sure somebody's picking them up is people will get them and not plant them, mm. but maybe a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was thinking maybe with the library seed bank, if, if they want us, I didn't hear back when I um, suggested we would, you know, want to collaborate on the, um, their seed library. So I'll follow up with that again later and just see, but there's, there is some potential and I have to see how many of them need to be sown like this week. And I, after the meeting, I can talk to you offline, Karen, about getting some seeds. That sounds great. Yeah, that's why we did the second round because we knew people, not everyone who wanted it got it. So mm -hmm. um, interestingly, this year didn't have the, um, big, big um, impact of everyone screaming for jugs and we had a plan to get jugs. So it's, that's been nice. People were saving them or getting them ahead of time, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's been my only downfall is I, at the last minute got a couple seeds and I only could find a couple jugs. So I haven't planted them all yet. Did you get some jugs from, uh, somebody was advertising them from your yeah, tent, Sarah? I, I'm going, I'm, I'm working on it. I have two okay. more packs. So um, let me, let me mute this for a minute. I may, I need to take a two second, really two seconds break. We do have uh, Mimi who has just joined us in the attendee group. All right, I'm back. I may, I may need to break again is, so Mimi's in the um, in the room. Mm -hmm. the room. Thank you. She's not waiting to get in. She's been in since almost the beginning. Okay. Um, next thing is um, there was a reason that flew into something else. Um, programming. Why I moved it. Um, So the Earth Day okay. is April 22nd. Two years ago, right before COVID, we had talked about having a Planet Palooza, a week-long celebration of the 50th anniversary of, of um the establishment of Earth Day. And I was thinking, you know, we had COVID, doesn't mean we can't have the Planet Palooza now, but we could probably do things more than we could before. And I'm thinking since then, we've also established new um, projects or collaborations with the South Broken Land Foundation, with the library, with the Rotary Club, um, and maybe other groups. And I was thinking we could bring in recreation, conservation, and make a bigger event. It's a little early for some of our pollination things. I'm gonna find out when do we need to start weeding? I, I think April might be a bit early, but maybe we could have an event at the new pollinator garden. It's a little early for planting, but, um, oh, so one of the other issues is Dr. G Gear and I'll reach out to him. If we could do a training for people, now that we get the gardens in, right? We need people to survey 
to see what species are using them. And maybe he could do the classroom overview and then we could have, once everything's in bloom, have a workshop in person, either at the Becology, at the Becology Garden at Breakneck and at the library garden that we expect to be in bloom this year. And maybe that could tie into students. Um, although the problem is getting people to survey um, it's school vacation when all the plants are blooming, who's going to offer to do that over the summer. So maybe we can do it a combination of students and, a, and adults, you know, take a certain, if people get um, trained and, you know, on some level, it's just going out and looking and taking videos. But I don't know if that, if they understand the reason why, maybe we could do that that presentation and open it up to a lot of different groups during that week. Would that sound like something you wanna do? I think that's a great idea. idea. Yeah. So that's April 22nd. So the week, that's a Friday. I'm thinking somewhere between the weekend before, the Friday before that, through the Sunday after the 22nd. And then just see how many activities usually the Rotary Club does a cleanup and then they have a event on the bandstand or somewhere for everyone to get together and have pizza. Maybe we could have them have their event at the, at the um, Pollination Preservation Garden, even though it won't be in bloom. It could be um, a tie in there. So we have, I would say one month to March 22nd, right? Gives us a month to put planning together and then do promotion, you know, make some partnerships. Does, any ideas on that with the schools? Um, I don't know if the schools, the younger schools are interested in doing anything. I think Melissa from Conservation usually does a poster contest. Could be really cool at the, story walk at the library if they were interested we could ask them if they could do a nature-based theme any any ideas i mean all those seem like great um great options so it's hard to know right it's hard to plan and that's the only reason i hesitate just because of you know not knowing how much people are going to be able to get together face to face but are you talking face to face or virtual i'm talking outside, mm -hmm. which is face-to-face, -face, which is pretty well documented to be safe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously if numbers go sky high, you know, we make changes, but, you know, throughout COVID after the first, um, as information became more available, it became clear that we were pretty safe outside. By the end mm -hmm. of April, all schools will be mask optional and probably buildings. So I think outside is a pretty safe bet. So I think we plan our activities outside. Yeah. And then I think Melissa in the past had a display of the posters in the library meeting room. But what if we work with her? This is just an idea. We haven't talked to the library. So all of this is just, you know, an idea to suggest and no assumptions made that anything would be, you know, allowed. But they have the story walk. What, what if they could somehow make a reproduction so that they don't get ruined if these are fragile material, you know, a print of some of the winning posters that people could go around outside and look at. Or we could do, I know some places, I've been to some, uh, and if that doesn't work, I've been to some conservation land where they put story walk books just in, they laminate it and stick it on a stake so they don't have a big fancy. Um, so we could even do that somewhere if we wanted to. Oh, and also to um, tap into the stewardship committee with their new trail naming program and you know, there could be something there. So that's another activity. We could we could even do it like, the, you know, have a display through the town forest or through Breakneck Hill. 
big, big, lots of ideas takes a lot of work, but um, we could see which ones excites anyone else who's our partner to work on. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we want to do that. Some and seeing if Dr. G gear will present is a good idea. I'd asked um, an insect guy who did a botany survey for us. He's fascinating, um, studies different insects. And I asked if he could uh, maybe give a presentation if that was an option. And he said, it's a little too early for, you know, April 22nd's a little early for a lot of the activity. So we can keep that on our list along with um, another visit by the uh, Caterpillar Lab would be really cool. All right, so next item is the New Pollination Preservation Gardens. Um, and this is just throwing these ideas out there, but they're not, um, you know, anything definite here, but where we're on a roll. And if what we did this year with the seeds, when we gave them out, we asked, we were able to ask if people would grow an extra jug. And some people said, yes. So we gave them extra seeds and then we're gonna contact them to give those back. So we may have some plants available for other places in town. But I was even thinking, you know, that's also a bit of a, maybe you get a, maybe you don't, it's okay for a maybe whatever shows up, shows up type garden. But for a planned garden, it's really a great idea to have funding. And that's what brought me to, um, it ties into these two next gardens with the, the topic after that. But if you went down by Southville Road at Route 85, across from the Triangle Garden, right where the ramp going up to the train station is on the sidewalk. It's a messy, you know, horrible, weedy, um, old tree saplings growing up. It's, it's just a mess, right? And I, I looked at it and I said, wouldn't it be pretty? Cause that's sort of an entrance way to that, the train station, they're talking about, you know, increasing, density of development there. Why don't we take care of that? We wouldn't have that landscape in the center of town. And I was just thinking what a waste it was when I found out that it's actually town owned land. <coughs> and it might come by and weed whack it once in a while. <coughs> I asked Karen Galligan if she would, you know, if that would be a, a location we could look at putting a garden in and she said yes. And then I looked at it, it has a pretty steep slope. And I started thinking it may not be the best place for the installation by volunteers because you don't want to create a situation with erosion. Um, Karen said DPW might clear the vegetation off, but um, that would be another conversation. But we would need, you know, maybe some professional installation of the plants would be better so we don't have them all wash out in the next rainstorm after you plant them and then I was um there's also you know where the old pound is behind next to the tot lot at the town the townhouse you familiar with that Karen the old pound I'm, I'm familiar with the tot the tot lot next to the town well there's a stone wall it's a pound next to the playground yeah next to yeah. the playground. And it's been dedicated to veterans now, yeah. but it was an original pound. Even the tot lot was part of it, I believe. Because oh. back in the day, these pounds were not for dogs. They were for like, if your cow got loose. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that. They had to bring the cow. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we could have a historical plaque, but you know, it's just a waste space. It's with weeds. Um, it's It's been weedy. Uh, one point, I think the DPW tried to clean it up. They put some, you know, some, stone dust down with a little yeah. path and it's just a mess of weeds. We did some weeding there last year when I had some volunteers last summer. I think it could be a place to put in pollinator plants. Mm -hmm. And that could also be a place where that might be a better place for leftover um, or donated plants from the winter so because it may not need to be as formal a garden because it's behind the stone walls. You don't see it so well, but it also, um, 
it could be for this next topic, which is, I'm moving into, ARPA funds. Mm. And we were asked to come up with recommendations and it's one of the things we have to do right away. And I just thought that putting together a garden down at the train station where anyone using the train station benefits, the neighborhood benefits, it's creating an attractive area that right now is pretty, it looks very depressing. So I would want the committee to see if we would recommend ARPA funding for that. And I don't know how much money, but you know, $20,000 would more than cover it. I'm sure a lot less, but um, I don't know if we have to have exact amounts. Um, maybe we have the vice chair of the ARPA committee, if I'm calling it the right thing. Can we bring Mimi up if she's willing? What sure. does that stand for? ARPA? It's, it's, um, I don't Mimi. know. Wait for Mimi. Is she there? Mm -hmm. Just promoted her. And hey, she's on mute, but she's here. Can you unmute Mimi? We have a question or two for you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hey. What's part of the stand for? American Rescue Plan Act. Oh. And if we make a recommendation, do we have to have a dollar amount? Um, you should have some estimate, yes. Okay. Can we say not more than? You can say anything you want. <laughs> not more than $1,000. Said. We need this by the, you said the 28th, but that's a Sunday. I, or I thought, I don't know that you said, I thought I heard. It's a Monday. 28th, February. Oh, 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 thank you. I keep getting confused because 28 days, not 31 or something. Okay. We need to make the recommendation by the 28th. Yeah. Um, so by Monday. How, how about... If the committee gives me permission, if they want to move forward on this, I can see if I can get an estimate of a garden there. And then put that in by Monday. You could probably base the estimate. Do you think you could base it off of what it cost you for the library garden? No. Because that was all volunteer labor. I'm talking about, you know, the, the, slope, the slope makes it more challenging. Is it right on the corner of? Yeah, you would think the look, it, it goes from the sidewalk and it goes up a hill to the, okay. to the behind Fitzy's parking lot. I looked on the map. It, it looks like it's Fitzy's landscape, but it's not. It's part of the right of way for the town or a lot of it is anyhow for the road. All right, so I'll look, uh, I, I can ask somebody who looked at So, um, Freddie, do you want us to take a quick break? Okay, I'm back. Sorry, I had a, had right. a little sound problem there. Um, that's a good, yeah, sound problems, technical difficulty. Um, so, I don't mind asking someone who gave me a quote for something else before. Okay, super. I put that and in there, so you'll get a quote. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I wanted to talk about, which isn't so much, well, I think we can make a recommendation because it has to do with um, open space, but the old burial ground behind the library, um, a while ago, they was the town um, approved funding for the gravestone restoration work there. And one of the things they said was that 
um, the expert that was hired, this was a project of the Historical Commission. The expert said that really moving forward, the best thing they could do, there's been so many trees that have come down over the you know, hundreds of years it's been there, is to replant trees, which helps prevent acid rain from hitting the, the gravestones and destroying them. So historic preservation for those stones could actually um, entail planting trees, replacing trees. And I think that's a complex situation because you have graves there. It's not a project I'm saying we would take the, um, the lead on, but I think we could make a recommendation and in our recommendation ask um, the Historical Commission and the Board of Selectmen and DPW who has oversight of that property and to the CPC, like C give them all a CC to see, you know, if that was something all of those groups uh, supported having it done. And I, I think it can come from us as an idea, but not a, not we would not take on a, I don't even know how the ARPA funds work. Mimi, when somebody puts forth a suggestion for money, who manages the project? Um, that should be in your request too, who will manage it. So we could manage a pollination habitat at the train station, but we would not be managing this. We would just be making the deadline, send it out this week for someone else to run with it or not. And CC ARPA committee. So because who would manage that DPW? I, I think they would have to work with the historic commission on the grades. And I think they did at one time have some radar. Maybe they need to do more. I don't know. Where you don't want to plant. I mean, I don't know, but you, I don't know how the graves impact planting trees because the existing trees certainly had big root system that might have, you know, disturbed. I don't think there's an intention that you can't have roots disturb a grave site. But it's not my area of expertise. I would say DPW was supposed to be in charge of the maintenance of that land. And when CPA funds projects, they ask who's going to maintain it. And I think it was um, declared, not declared, but you know, agreed that the Historical Commission and DPW would work on it together. Now, things fall through the cracks and there's always funding's an issue. It seems like this would be you know, could be potentially a good use of those funds. And I would have no idea of how much money you'd want to plant, not tiny trees. But if, so this would be a second recommendation that we put it out there as an idea and that we would hope DPW Historical Commission, doesn't the planning board have a tree initiative in town? Would you be somebody who would partner on this? We're a tree city. I know we're a tree city, but are there programs that that or at least that encourages tree planting? Yes. So you could be a supporter of it, not a manager of the project. All right. Yeah. So we would let everyone know we think this would be a good project for the funding. No, the other issue is, you know, we're, I've been to some conferences recently and we're headed into a situation of impacts from climate change and planting trees and having trees is like one of the best things you can do to offset a lot of the impact. Um, so it seems like it hits a lot of buttons here. Um, okay, is that, so I'll write that up too. We don't have to take a vote, do we? Or should we? I don't. Know. We're, doesn't we're hurt. In, what? Doesn't hurt. All right. The motion would be something, somebody could say so moved. I'm gonna to try to rephrase what we've just discussed. 
to ask for ARPA funding to create a pollinator preservation habitat at Route 85 and Southville Road at the entrance to the train station to improve a blighted area. I don't know if blighted is the right word, but a to approve a what kind of area? I'm sorry. Neglected. A what? Neglected. A what type of area? Neglected. The neglected is better than blighted, although the impact is it looks blighted, but a neglected area of town property. So moved. And I would wait a minute. I'm All right. going to have three three parts, right? Okay. Freddie will research the cost associated to put such a habitat in to get an estimate for the request. And that will go to the ARPA committee and DPW because DPW has control of that land. Second, to put a recommendation to plant trees in the old burial ground using the ARPA funds for a project to be looked at by the Historical Commission and DPW as part of the historic preservation of that land and to improve, to comply with our tree city designation to plant trees. And that will be CC'd to the Selectman Historical DPW planning. And did I miss anyone? I think that's so it. What, you, what did you say to comply with our tree city? And then I didn't catch the last part. Designation. And we'll CC that to it's our recommendation that someone adopt this as a project. And the players are the DPW and Historical Commission. But we will CC the selectmen, the planning board, Historical Commission, and the DPW. And that this, all, this also the planning board and what were the others? Sorry, I don't type as fast as you talk. <laughs> DPW. DPW, yeah. Historical Commission. Selectman. Yep, got those. Planning board. And I think I should say, I'm sorry, I'm trying to say it better. Our select board. Change that terminology. Um, and the planning board. Select board, um, a different term for selectmen. More in a new term. We like changed that. the name. I like it. Yeah. Great. I'm going to take out selectmen then. Yeah. We have a select board. And then, is that the correct terminology? Designation now? Select board. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Um, can we also? Mention, I'll send it to conservation as it is also part of a, I'm sure it's part of a mitigation for climate change. We have a municipal vulnerability report that came out. So I think it hits, I think it hits a lot of things and it's probably not a huge expense, but I'm not going to investigate that. I don't know if ARPA can work on it as a recommendation, but at least we put it out there. Is that, you know. All right, next agenda item. Where are we on time? Uh, we are okay, we're we all at two o'clock. Halfway done. So have right. it out. And the next item on the agenda is the recommendation South Union School. Wow. Well, okay. I, I have, so 
and we we already took a vote on this before so this will just be updating it again i think it's still going to be maybe on the agenda there's a plan we've never been brought into the discussion supposedly before recommendation was made they were going to reach out to all the interested parties we had recommended that we be included from the beginning as an interested party of open space on the disposition of the South Union School. There is a park in front of the building below the stairs with a circular driveway around it. It has great value for creating the presence and the importance of that building. The viewscape from South Bill Road and from um, Island Street as well as it's a denser neighborhood without a lot of parks and that that park should be, I'm gonna ask that we recommend deed protected if they dispose of the building. And we recommend what, I'm sorry? It'd be deed protected. Deed protected. Deed. Oh, deed protected, okay. As a open space parcel not to be built upon in perpetuity. My fear is, I, and I haven't seen the plans because they haven't reached out to us, but my fear is that there's a desire to, I've heard, unload the building, use it for housing, which could then look at the land around it for condos. And you would totally lose the presence of the building if there was a big condo in front yeah. of it, that beautiful stairway. And in some areas, a small parcel of land that gives you a feeling of openness and, you know, has greater value than the size of the park. Didn't we talk also too about the value of the playground in that area? We did. Mm -hmm. We can add that in here that the playground should remain. I mean, there was talk of replacing it into another area that was like, and what does that do for this area that's densely, more densely built out and potentially, potentially um, going to be zoned for 12 units an acre. 15. 15 units an acre? Yeah, so how many, how many, I don't know the size of that lot, but how many units could you put on that, which is, you know, that's a whole nother issue about that zoning. But if you, if the town were going to that level of zoning, you really need that playground and you need that grassy area. And, you know, it may seem like it's just a you know, an unused grassy area, but I can guarantee when um, there's no other place to go, kids will be playing Frisbee there or, you know, it's a place to go. And it's even more valuable than the place to go, but the feeling of openness. So that's my recommendation. Just do you, others agree and do we want to vote on that? I agree. Sarah? I agree. Um, you know, so, okay. So I think we voted on this before, but just vote yeah, on it again. I think it's in our notes from the past. That just vote that we will, we will restate our interest in preserving that parcel of land is open space, deed protected in perpetuity, as well as keeping the playground on location. Is there a motion? Um, Somebody say so moved. So moved. Is there a second? I second. All in favor? Karen Svikovich is in favor. Sarah Rossiton, Sarah. in favor. Freddie Gillespie's in favor, so it passes unanimously. I just realized we made a nice motion on the last one, but I don't remember taking a vote. I was going to say that. All right, so let's go back and vote that one. Let me to read have it? the motion. I have the re I have the motion here. Should I reread it? Okay. Freddie made a motion to ask for the ARPA funding to create a pollinator habitat at the entrance of the train station to improve a neglected area of town property. Freddie will research the cost that will go to the ARPA committee and DPW to put a recommendation to plant trees in the old burial group for a project to be 
looked at by the Historical Commission and the DPW to comply with our tree city designation. It is our recommendation that someone adopt this project. We will CC the Planning Board, DPW, Historical Commission, Conservation Commission, and Select Board. Can I make a couple amend amendments? It's the old yep. burial ground, not, I don't know what you had next to burial. Oh, and, burial ground. Yep, it's and I think it's not to comply with the tree city. Should it be to support? Can our planning board member? To support, sure. I can change comply to, to support. Is there better language for what we do with the tree city? To support our tree city designation. That's good. It's fine. Support. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we have a motion by me. Is there a second? We can second. And all in favor, Sarah? Sarah Satano in favor. Karen? Karen Sukovich in favor. And Freddie Gillespie in favor. All right. So that's ARPA. Check that off our agenda whipping through this robust agenda. The next thing is uh, Chestnut Hill Farm Management Plan. Right, and we are going to table that for this meeting. We are going to have a meeting um, next Friday to go over that, okay? So moving on. Recommendation 325 Turnpike Road, Ken's Foods, Wildflower Meadow, Replacement Area, Site Plan, <laughs> Lower Impact, Special Permit, and Wetland Permitting. So we've met with the proponents of this in the past. And then I was to do some site walks. I did maybe two. And one of them was with, um, Mimi was there and so was town planner. And I've done some investigation into how you would accomplish the wildflower meadow since we met. That was one of the tasks the committee gave me. And I've met with a wild, wild flower meadow expert. So I'm updating you on that so we can make our recommendations, okay? Mm -hmm. So first of all, um, we agree that the area was okay if they can get the permitting from the, the Conservation Commission. Um, I'm sorry, I just, I got distracted um, and I have to stop for one minute, okay? Sure. Go ahead and put a quick hold. Are you in Vermont, Karen? No, I'm in Massachusetts. Oh. I'm splitting my time. We're, we're trying to go to Vermont kind of Thursday to Sunday most weeks and then we can get away. But we're also airbnb it. So right now we have Airbnb guests in Vermont. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, it's school vacation week. So it was popular week for rental. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay, I'm back. Meeting's back Great. in session. Sorry. Um, the, so let me get back to the agenda though. I'm here, but. I'm so not. you had just said that you went on a site walk. Oh, um, okay. So I, I, I have some uh, conditions to, I mean, some recommendations for a recommendation to the planning board. And as we know, there was a huge bail on the part of the applicant in installing a meadow there before. And now they're putting a building on top of where the meadow was supposed to be and then going to put a replacement meadow in. So we know that creating these meadows are dif is difficult. It's not just sprinkle some seeds down. And I've learned this myself uh, through experience and also from this um, expert in meadow management. So I thought we could make some um, recommendations tied to some conditions so that for a, a meadow installation, the first thing you do is you, it takes a season of soil prep. You can't just throw the seeds now. 
and that might have been where they failed. Who know? I don't know what they did. So we'd like to have. Um, it was recommended that we have some benchmarks to make sure they're moving in the right direction. So you have the soil prep. That's a whole season. And then you put the seeds down, which we want to recommend a mix. And that's a second. Um, it's one of the things I'm working on with earned seeds, seed mixes. Availability comes and goes. So as long as it's a certain percentage of these um, seeds, it would be okay if they were out of something. So you can't be quite that specific, but the recommendation would be that they work with an expert or earned seeds can help them because you want a certain mix of a plant community with grasses and vegetation, but different niches have to be filled. And it's complicated. It's a very complicated, um, almost like a recipe of what seeds go together. But we want it to be predominantly using focus on Dr. G Gear's seed list with others thrown in to create the full plant community that's needed to have a successful meadow. And that's one of the things um, you need some plants that like are annuals and then some they hold space while the other plants are establishing roots and then the other plants come in and take over later. So that will be part of the recommendation I'm, off, I'm suggesting. So you have soil prep, then you seed with the correct seeds. That's the second one. And then you have a year of managing it different than how it eventually gets managed. You have to um, use like a string cutter or mow at a certain height before it gets too tall because the weed, even if you do soil prep, the weed pressure is huge. And when you cut it, it pushes back the weed pressure and allows the native plants to be establishing roots and to be getting stronger. And you do that throughout the season according to the recommendation of a meadow installer expert. So the second thing is we saw next to the habitat, it goes right up to a wetland, 20 foot no touch buffer. And within that buffer, it looked pretty healthy except for the invasives. So we would recommend they remove the invasives and replant wherever they disturb the soil with native shrubs from Dr. G. Gear's list. And that creates one, two, three, four, I think it's six items. Remove invasives, replant with shrubs from Dr. G. Gear's list. It's two, three, meadow soil prep, seeding, final year meadow is established after a full season of work on it. So that's a three year process. Um, I'd like to, it was a concerning comment made at our, one of our site visits by the um, environmental consultant when there were other plantings that were a prior permit required weren't done in addition to the meadow wasn't completed. And it was something to the, if not exact in this tone of, we didn't know you went by the book, that the decision didn't really mean they had to follow it. And that's concerning attitude because I don't think it was just that person's, he wouldn't have come up with that on his own, maybe. Who knows? But I think given that, and on top of the other plants that aren't from a different permit, not our meadow, that weren't there as, required in a prior permit, as well as the complete fail of this meadow they were supposed to put in and they had quite a few years to do it. Um, I, I'm comfortable recommending that we put a, a bond requirement that um, see, I'm suggesting say $6,000 I guess, sorry, Freddie, I don't really know what that means, a bond requirement of $6,000. So they have to issue a bond and they don't get the money back till they're in compliance with doing the work they're required to do. Uh -huh. It's a recommendation to the planning board who would decide we have no ability to 
do anything but say this might be a good idea for you to consider given mm -hmm. the um and you know the planning board in their wisdom will decide what to do after negotiating with the project proponent um or not negotiating but discussing um, so can i ask a question mimi is that typical like do we do that pretty often like to try to get people to do what they say they're going to do do a bond requirement um it has been done especially when um conditions don't get met or yeah yeah i mean it seems like great yeah right you know, because it's so hard to ensure that you can have accountability so that's good and what we're doing now on the planning board is um we're having the proponent pay for a consultant to follow the site plan through to make sure that things are getting done throughout the process. What's what's happened in the past is that they've come in for an occupancy permit and we go out and it's like, you know, this isn't done, that's not done. So to have a consultant do that and follow along and make sure things are getting done um, according to the yeah, it's awesome. Conditions. Before, so that's awesome. The, it's not a punishment. It's just an encouragement, I would say. Um, and previously, we had had discussions on you might have this. We might have been talking about this when you first got here, Karen, because so often the this was for the open space set asides. They just were ignored, and it, we were talking about how to use bonding or some sort of component to ensure that things were done the way the decision required. And certainly, I think it's better to use a bond than a lack of, um, which helps encourage things as you're going along than to have just rely on, which is another area, the occupancy re um, requirement. And one of my concerns is that this landscape is going to take longer, I think, than they may take to build and get the occupancy. Do you have any idea, Mimi, on how long? Do they put that in their plans or? How long for them to? Build. Oh, I don't know, but I think um, they'll start right away. Right, and then they'll want to build. I mean, how long does it take to put a building up? It's not a, I mean, they might be ready to occupy in a year, within a year, and this landscape won't be done for three years. And to me, it seems the bond could help with that, allow them to not tie up the occupancy because this term hasn't been met but to allow them to still have some incentive to complete the landscape as required. I don't know what other term you could use for that. Yeah, um, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with you pretty, I just, did, I just wanted to know more about it. I yeah, no, I'm, I'm not thinking oh. you were, I'm just trying to explain yeah, it differently. Yeah. Um, so my recommendation would be putting some benchmarks in like, and I, I think I've heard this before that a percentage can be released when you met certain thresholds. So like remove the invasives, 15%, replant with shrubs, 15%, metals, soil prep done, 15%, put the seeding in 15%. And then it, I think that adds up to like 60%. And then when you have the full meadow in at the third year established, because you may have to go back and make some fixes, then you get the 40% remaining back when that's done. And I would also recommend that they, I, I don't know if this can be done, but they use a professional knowledgeable meadow installer for um, advice. That would be a recommendation. I don't think you can compel, but is there any way Mimi, if the planning board is having someone go through the site plans that we could recommend that they use them um, for the landscape. They use a landscape professional familiar with native plants because it's not, it's a new field. It's not, you know, you can get a landscape architect that knows nothing about 
how these metals, particularly metals, are done. Um, I'm not sure if we can require who they hire, but we can certainly recommend it. Well, I'm talking about is the plan your the planning board is making them pay for someone to go through the site plan, ensuring everything's done. Oh, have a have a consultant who is a a subcontractor, not to do everything else, but just for the for the landscape portion of it. Um, well, that's a tricky question because we're contracted with Fuss and O'Neill would have to contract with somebody else. So we've asked Fuss and O'Neill for to have a landscape architect like um, this spring go out to Northborough Road. I've we'll see how they do. My experience, and I'm not saying anything about Boston O'Neill in this case, is that many, almost all of the landscape architects I've run into are not proficient in knowing anything about native plant um, requirements. So that's, that's just my why. And on top of that, a meadow is a complete different situation, really not. People think you just throw some seeds down and they don't have a clue. You know, our landscape has been so impacted for over 200 years by prior agricultural use that trying to get some sort of decent habitat to grow is, is not as simple as one would hope or would imagine. Um, the other component of this is that there's a wetland permit required that we could comment on. And if you're, one of the things we asked for, part of the meadow, the, no, the building is now in a riverfront area. Even though that was previously disturbed, I'm pretty sure that the Conservation Commission cares about putting a building on riverfront area. And that, you know, having some habitat mitigation for that. And I was, when we remember when we mentioned it, they said that Ken's was a big fan of the clean look of a, a lawn going up to the building from Route 9. I drove by there yesterday and I just happened to glance over and I said, oh my goodness, that whole view is negatively impacted by the huge amount of Phragmites. You can't even see half of the lawn because of the Phragmites. And it would seem to me to be worthwhile to remove the non-native invasive Phragmites, which would give them a better view of their lawn, and also to replace it with native species. And that would be a recommendation to the Conservation Commission as a mitigation for the encroachment on the, or the building, I won't call it encroachment, the building on the um, riverfront area, which, you're not supposed to build on. You need some, you know, you need to do some mitigation for that, even if it's been previously disturbed with a whatever. So that would be, and Mimi, would the occupancy permit automatically come into play with all of this? If this was in the decision, we don't have to write also the occupancy permit is determined by meeting this these thresholds. Yeah, the building, um, the way the software is set up, the, the, the Conservation Commission and the town planner to have to sign off before an occupancy permit can be issued. Is that new? Yeah. That's, that's good news. Yeah. It's like making some more, more um, better process. Yeah. Great. Okay, so we have this long motion to approve. So it is a recommend, I'm gonna say it and then you can say so moved and then type it the best you can, Karen, and I, we can listen to the um, video to get it exact later. 
Um, so the motion would be that we accept the area on the plan for the wildflower meadow. That we we're communicating a we start with this as a recommendation to the planning board that we accept the area on the plan for the meadow, but we'd like them to remove the invasives within the 20 foot no touch zone. It's not the 20 foot no touch. What is that? The 20 foot wetland buffer town bylaw and replant with shrubs from Dr. G Gears list. We want the meadow installation and the invasive removal to be encouraged, encouraged isn't the right word, subject to a, a bond, a $6,000 bond we recommend to ensure that the different stages are, are properly met, which starts with the soil prep in year one for season, seeding with approved seed mix by the town planner and the Open Space Preservation Commission from Dr. G. Gear's list and working with a custom seed mix from a place such as Burnt Seeds. And a final third year management to get the meadow properly established with a release of bond funds at 15% for the invasive removal, 15% for planting with shrubs, 15% for the meadow soil prep, 15% for the approved seed mix, planted an uh, appropriate method for a meadow installation, and then the remaining 40% year three with the meadow properly established. as determined by a meadow expert. And secondly, a motion, the motion includes a recommendation to the Conservation Commission that as mitigation for the building within the riverfront area, that the Phragmites be cleared along Route 9. There's a P and an H in it. I don't know, we can, we can correct that later. Um, removed and planted with native plants from wetland plants from Dr. G. Gears list. And just a, um, and that's the end of our recommendations. So I'm making that motion. So moved. So Sarah makes the motion. Is there a second? Oh, I'm sorry, Sarah makes the motion or Freddie makes the motion? Sarah made the motion. I said so moved. So she did. Is there a okay. second, Karen? Yeah, I'll, I'll second the motion. Okay, all in favor, Sarah? Sarah Vasatano in favor. Karen Svikovich in favor. Freddie must be in favor. That was a biggie and it's done and it's a big deal. So that's great that we got that done. Um, and I'll write it up and I'll send a copy to the planner and to the um, applicant as well. Um, By Monday? That, what? By Monday? Before Monday. Okay. This meeting was put in place for, that was one of the key points with a lot of deadlines which is why it's such a robust agenda. 
Um, let's see, what do I have next? So I have 200 Turnpike Road, major site plan and lid permit review. We are going to comment, um, comment. I'm going to give you an update, but we're going to table reviewing the plans because they don't have anything for us to review beyond saying they don't have any native plants in the buffers. There's no lid techniques and we look forward to the next set of plants. I think that covers it. So um, for the lower impact development, there's techniques you can use that require native plants and they didn't um, include any in the plan. And then for the, there's a buffer zone required to adjacent properties that is just grass and doesn't have any um, shrubs or trees that you would expect in a buffer, which would be required per our bylaw to be native plants. Did I state that correctly, Mimi, do you think? Was that an adequate review? So I have a copy of the plan if you wanna pull it up or. Yeah. Can not you really that? much. Yeah. That would be helpful so that we can say that others looked at it. Can she share her screen? Yeah, I'm working on it. No, no, I was just making sure you were allowed. Do you see it? I think. I do. Yep, there we go. No? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I can see it. So in the upper left is the, um, the plants that they're using which are native, so that's that's a good thing. But those plants are where? So the only place they have plants is right here, right by the building. So the buffers, that the, they're required buffers all around and it's all grass. Right, so we want, we would expect that to be in shrubs or trees to create a buffer between the, the, the goal of a buffer is to create a buffer between the, the neighbors, right? Even if it's, even if it's um, wetlands or habitat. And it looks like some of it's DCR land. Here. Yep. Yeah. And some of it is and Route 9 is out here, just so you. And what is, the, what is the open space there? Is that on the adjacent parcel? What open space? Undisturbed open space is called out. I hadn't noticed on that On the before. left. You can't see my cursor. Right there, I mean. Right there, and then more to the left. Oh, wow. I didn't even notice that. So that is part of that uh, parcel. Is it a prior decision? Or are they offering it up for whatever reason? They're probably offering it up. I'll have to go look at it because it's behind this other building. I wonder if it's like pavement. <laughs> That abuts DCR land also, right? Yeah. All right, so. So this is their frontage right here, this weird little thing. It's their frontage on what? Middle road. Which way is the uh, route nine? Up here, up on the top. Okay, so that's coming out to middle road. Oh, it's one of those re reasons we have a 75 foot ball has to travel. Yeah, they, they don't have the required frontage and they needed to get a special permit from the ZBA, which they didn't do. They haven't gotten that yet? Well, they went before the ZBA to get the um, special permit to go over 50,000 square feet or whatever, but they didn't. Um, I think that's what, it, I don't remember what the 
they did get one in the building commissioner recommended, said they needed two and they went before for one and not the other. I'm just curious um, if this, oh, I'm look, using my cursor, but you can't see it. If the road frontage on middle road is undisturbed open space, how can that be road frontage? Don't you have to cross, have the ability, even if you don't use it to cross over? Yep. So that doesn't make sense. It'd be interesting to find out if that was a prior permit or not. So that's another homework we have. But it doesn't look like, even if, so this is for um, Sarah and Karen. In planning board permitting, you don't have to access the property through the road frontage but you have to be able to, to get it considered as road frontage. And if that's an undisturbed open space parcel, that's not available for frontage in my opinion. So. I'm looking at the satellite map. Uh-huh. To see what. That looks like all grass with a couple trees. On Middle Road? From that triangle to the left, the, the left undisturbed open space. And so if that in effect is supposed to be undisturbed open space and it's well, lawn? Well, it's being mowed, parts of it. That was another area we had concerns about because if you're taking a mowed or lawn area and creating undisturbed open space, you're likely going to end up with invasives if you just stop mowing it, if you don't do some sort of planting. I'm curious to know why it's, I think before our next meeting, we need to figure out why it's, are they offering it up as open space, but they're, I don't think they're required for open space. It's not a subdivision, is it, Mimi? No. So they're not required unless it's left over from an old subdivision? Yeah, unless they subdivided that lot in the past sometime, then open space would be required. You know, we can go and look, we can investigate this, but I think there's concerns over if they're adding it as open space, why and how are they managing it? And or was that something they put in to make us feel like it was a good offering and maybe mistakenly um, thought out? You know, maybe they're trying to do something positive with the land, which should be acknowledged if it, that's what they're trying to do. It's kind of a weird shape, though. Okay, um, so, and then the other thing is when they do the development, and this is salt storage, is that correct? Yeah. Road salt storage or just snow? Yeah. So when you store snow, I don't know if there's any regulations, but doesn't it usually come contaminated with all kinds of- um, Well, not snow storage, salt to uh, road salt. Oh, it's road salt. Okay. So. And DCR was concerned about that. And supposedly they have enclosed the storage. So there's no possibility of it leaching into the uh, DCR property. But I don't think we've, I don't know if they sent these plans to DCR, but I wouldn't be comfortable with approving anything until DCR said they were happy with it. And then there's stormwater management. Are there any new buildings? Proposed building. Two proposed, one's a proposed building and one's an enclosed shed. Yeah, one's the, for the salt and right. one's uh, like a big garage to park all their trucks. So 
I mean, one would hope that they would have some low impact development techniques for that, for the storm water or the water or land change for keeping all that salt there. It seems like they're doing a lot of grading. Is that correct? Yeah, they're grading and filling the entire site. So up currently abutting the DCR land, it's all like a meadow. There was a lot of uh, milkweed in there when I went out and looked before. So they're grading all of that and paving it all. Grading, filling, and paving it all. So that's a huge negative impact to mm -hmm. the environment. Would, could we... Uh, people get a right to develop their land, but I don't know what... I think it sounds like there should be some mitigation in low impact development techniques to make up for that. So we'll, we'll come back to this at another time, but right now we're just saying that they don't have, we're, we want more information about the undisturbed open space. There's no low impact development techniques and it seems like there's no plantings in the required buffer zone. And that's a res B, which requires a deeper buffer. Do they even mark it on the plan? Even though it's DCR land, if the residential zoning is there. Do they have the right distance of um, no development for a buffer? I don't think so. I haven't gone through these plans in detail. I just look quickly at the sparse landscaping. Um, mm -hmm. So I think they need a 20 foot buffer that abuts any residential, anything residentially zoned, which they do not have. I don't think. And the buffer doesn't mean just land you don't build on because that's a setback, a buffer implies plantings. Well, a landscape buffer is what is okay. required. Okay, so we'll be interested in seeing what they propose for plantings in the landscape buffer. Um, all right, so I think that's enough for this because we, we just need more information and we still have a bunch of stuff on our agenda I want to get through in 20 minutes and I wonder if we should um, have one of those things be the minutes or just because they've yeah. been yeah the minutes will be there December but yeah let me uh, let me go to um, the agenda, the next agenda item. Thank you, first of all, thank you, Mimi, for your help. Yeah, Mimi, that was awesome that. to see that. Very helpful. Um, Pleasure. We like having you here at our meetings. Um, Harvard Book Depository. We had a successful um, review and they're agreeing to use the native plants on their lawn alternative instead of the non-native ones. And after that, because we met, I was able to set up a meeting with Krista Collins from Suburb Valley Trustees, their land protection specialist, myself and the people from the Harvard um, real estate office, just to open the doors of communication, letting them know that that property is one of the highest priorities for protection in the state's open, I mean, in the town's open space and rec plan wildlife habitat report, but also um, it was rewarding to hear that they're investing in the book depository, which means they have no plans to, you know, further develop beyond, you know, um, like for a while there, there was talks of them selling it and then maybe somebody wanting to do bigger development on that parcel. So it seems to be a small benign use for that wonderful land that will continue to work as great open space. It abuts, it abuts the Bay Circuit Trail and the reservoir. 
it has high priority for Sudbury Valley trustees as part of a greater Callahan State Park plan we made. So it still provides that even if it's not permanently protected, but we at least have connections now to talk to if something changes in their goals for the rest of the land, because it's 88 acres and the developed area is just a small portion. So we just like to, just felt really positive all around. Um, St. Mark's Road Park. Um, there's a subcommittee for that looking at it. We, they didn't put anyone on it that is representing any committee. I may personally put my name in if they have an open seat, if it seems that they're going to talk about changing the layout. I originally was believed that they're only meeting to talk about what goes into the interior of the, where the playground had been before, some sort of statue or something, but I wasn't able to attend their first meeting. I had a conflict, but um, it seems there may be more than just that discussed at some point. And also that our concern has always just been, we didn't plan the, the design or the layout we were just reviewing the plant choices for the pollinator garden. And as we wrote a support letter for that grant, you know, I recommend that we continue to advocate that they keep a pollinator garden as part of that property with all native straight species, plants and trees for the entire property, even the non pollinator garden. Um, is there any, that was what we said at the beginning, is there any, conversation on that? Karen, Sarah? No, I mean, we were always just very proud that they, uh, you know, that they did what they did with the native plants and were so receptive. So we certainly want to maintain them. Right. So there's the controversy about all the trees that came down. We had no role to play in that and would just want to ensure that what gets planted during the building of the property park um, maintains true to what the original intent with the um, pollination preservation, well, pollinator gardens. I have to, uh, there was quite a few cultivars and some non-native to this region um, species used. We went over it a long time ago and I'm gonna resend that to Karen again, okay? Any any other comments you have on that? Okay. Why don't we um, skip ahead to the minutes so we make sure we get that done. So taking that out of order. Um, let me see, I'm gonna Take a look. I'm going to share my screen so that we can see the minutes, Freddie. And we can okay, that would be helpful. I've got a tiny strip there. Just, are you seeing that tiny strip, Karen? Well, that tiny strip is our faces. Let me move our faces away. Mm -hmm. All right, is that better? Yep. I see that some of the stuff we voted on before um, or we discussed before we voted today on the um, Ken's. Mm -hmm. um, in that, that last meeting, I'm just noticing that we talked about expanding the 20 foot no touch to 100 feet, but we didn't vote on that today. 
Did I spell Dr. Gutierrez's name right? I was struggling with that. No. Yeah, it looks like Agar counter. Um, G E G G E G E A R E A R, not I E R. G E G, no R in the beginning. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah, so let's change it throughout. G E G E A R. Um, under the update for lower impact development on 156 Northboro Road, mm -hmm. I would say that after a site visit, it was determined that most of the plants were cultivars. And some of the plants are in the wrong place and it doesn't comply with the approved landscape plan. And did you catch up, Karen? Yep, can you see what I'm typing right now? Oh, I wasn't, I was looking at my phone where I have it written. Um, where are you? Right here. Okay. And it is before the planning board. I don't know, we didn't make a recommendation there. We had a conversation uh, to ensure it complies with the existing permit. Okay. Um, under St. Mark's Roads Park, didn't we mention that the trees have been cut down? All right, new members, we don't need outreach for minutes. You may be looking for a minute taker, but we need outreach from members. Oh, members. <laughs> to take the minutes. Yeah, who <laughs> can also take over my job minutes, yes. <laughs> and then under minutes, did we approve minutes? At our last meeting? Uh, let's see. I think we got to um, you can just write minutes were approved. It's not perfect. Oh, but... 10, 21, 21 minutes. Okay. So what we should do in minutes from now on is say who made the motion and, you know, like every other motion that we all approved. I'm sure they were all approved. I think they were amended, so approved as amended. Unanimous. Okay, annual report, we needed to submit it. Needs to be submitted, let's say OSBC annual report needs to be submitted, that's all you need to write. And take out library native pollination preservation garden, we talked about that up ahead. So just take, the, take that out. And then just say we discussed quick review overview of the 
just write quick overview in front of native pollinator, native plant initiative. Chair, chair discussed project status. Something like that. Um, and then chair report. Um, I would say can you just say for Chestnut Hill Farm management plan review? Not a meeting, I, we didn't go to a meeting. Just plan review, yeah. And then under ash trees, possible loss due to emerald ash borer. Did you emerald what? Ash borer. Is that the name of it? I think so. E A B. Okay, that looks good enough. No E on the ash, though. It's an ash tree. Okay. All right. So, is there a motion to approve these minutes as amended? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes as amended. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. All in favor, Sarah? Sarah Rossitano in, in favor. Freddie Gillespie in favor. Karen. Karen Sweekovich in favor. It went out of order just to see <laughs> if you were paying attention. That motion passes unanimously. So we're done with the minutes. You can take that off the screen. Back to the agenda with seven minutes to go. Yippee. All right. Um, Did you skip over collaboration Rotary Club? presentations. Oh yeah, I did by mistake. Glad we had that we would go out of order if needed. So we are collaborating with the Rotary Club. They did have Dr. G. Gear give a presentation. I was slated to give a second pres presentation, but they like to do it live with the, and with the Omicron, everything got shut down. So that's been postponed. So I think we may be doing it in March or April, and I'll let you know when they give me a date, but it's a co-sponsored, you know, of our work, but it will be talking about the different gardens and our projects. So, um, and hopefully we'll be talking about um, the Planet Palooza and how we can work together for that. So that's that agenda item. Did you get that, Karen? Because mm -hmm. we jumped back up, so that might have been confusing. Um, and then the other was just, this has been an ongoing stress for me. The public display, Native Pollination Preservation Garden at the library. Um, and we're doing a CPA application for phase two, which is really not, We've already gone over it a ton of times. It's just cleaning out the woodlands of invasives and replanting with some shrubs from Dr. G. Gear's list that will survive in the shade to create a nice habitat and to put some um, shade loving plants in some other areas that will be cleaned out. And then leaving any dead trees that are up except for branches that are falling to impale visitors. We wanna get rid of those branches, but you know, if, if a tree is, you know, whatever trees are there, we want to make sure they maintain, except for three scraggly cra um, crab apples or something that aren't surviving well. We want to take those out and replace with shrubs. We've gone over it. Um, I don't have the, I meant to and wanted to have the picture graphics for you today, but the winter so became a full-time job for a while there. 
So hopefully I will have that to you guys soon. And also to the library, I've heard they're increased, um, not increased, but continued um, expression for support for us to do that work there. Another area came up for us to just be aware of. If you pull into the library parking lot from the driveway closer to the St. Mark's parking lot, there's an area that floods and it flows like a stream. I have video of it. And I had asked Karen if there was any plan for that part of the St. Mark's um, project, even though it's on the library grounds. And she says, well, we'll just fill it in. And my understanding is that when you have a underground spring surfacing that you need more than filler to rectify it. Although some of that water issue might be satisfied with techniques they're doing on the road relocation. But if it's an underground spring, I don't think, you know, I don't know how well that will work. So I mentioned that to the some of the library trustees who thought it could be a great idea to put in a rain garden habitat there. It is not a project I would suggest the Open Space Commission would oversee or be that involved with besides recommending some wonderful plants to use. Willows particularly are a keystone plant in Dr. G. Gear's pollination preservation. So we'd wanna have those conversations with the trustees, but it's, you know, trustee um, driven agenda item. And it also, a lot of this is compliant. I mean, compliant is dependent on what happens with the St. Mark's, which redesign trails might, or pathways may be changing there. But um, it's just something, somebody I work with in Worcester, Leonardo, you may have met him. He's great, yeah. Yeah, okay. He's, he has sent me some plans. He just did a massive rain garden on the grounds of his church. It's a bioretention area that the city put in when they redid a street. And I will have those that video and those pictures available for you and the trustees to see what can be done. It's just really amazing. Um, and then he's growing his, at his church. This is church land in Worcester with his volunteers. They, he grew and they planted 5,000 plugs last year and he's growing another 14,000 this year. So he he's quite knowledgeable on how to make these things happen. And we're lucky to have him as a resource. And then the other issue is um, future programming and the seed, oh, and the seed library. They do have a seed library. They're having an event at the end of March. I will suggest that we participate and see if that's something they're interested in. And if not, we can find out how else to use our seeds elsewhere. And programming, if, um, Sarah, you had reached out once last fall for the availability of doing programming and they were booked up through December, was that correct? We never got a feedback on how long it had. We have to let them know that we want to collaborate with them on programming, did we? Um, no. Um, let me look back. Oh, oh, never mind. It's three o'clock, so we can have this conversation another time. I want to be respectful of Karen's time and end now. Sorry, um, I'm not to yeah. yeah. So we can look into this later, but it's a it's an ongoing project. Um, Oh, and I did want to mention we have a new liaison to the Open Space Commission on the um, Pollination Preservation Garden at the library, and that will be Janet Maney moving forward. Okay? Okay. So is there a motion to adjourn? It's 301. Uh, I can make a motion to uh, adjourn the meeting. Is there a second? I can second. All in favor? Freddie's in favor? Karen. Sarah Rossitano in favor. Karen Svickowitz in favor. Okay, great. Thank you all very much. And thank, thank you, everybody. Great to have you, Mimi. Thank, thank you, guys. You.
Thank you. Take care. Enjoy spring for one day. Yeah, it's so beautiful, right? I wish I didn't have a call right now because I just want to be outside. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.